Good evening, church. How's everybody doing tonight? Y'all sound kind of asleep. <laughs> um, yeah, so they kind of introduced me, but it's part of my introduction, so I'm just going to do it again. Um, my name is Aiden Corley, and I am the administrative assistant here at Calvary Chapel, Lexington. Um, and pretty much what that entails is that I just do whatever Pastor John and Pastor Joe um, need me to do. Now, a lot of the time, that's video editing and working on the app and the archives and YouTube and stuff like that. But something that might be a little more familiar with y'all, every once in a while, a slide might be wrong. God forbid. Um, or maybe, maybe like there's not sound on a video. I'm the doing of that. I'm your guy. Um, but before I, you know, was up here and was serving on staff um, and screwing up slides and stuff like that, um, I was in the youth, um, as Pastor John mentioned, and I had been coming on and off and um, really was just coming to hang out with friends and God got a hold of my heart one day and was like, I want to do great things with you, but I need you to take me serious. And um, some time went by and I went in and out of the youth still and um, eventually after like hitting rock bottom, I was like, all right, you got it. Like, whatever you say, you got it. Um, and I started coming here and serving, and um, God started to bless me. And like Pastor John said, I became a youth leader, and then I, I actually taught my first lesson a year and a half ago, and now I'm in Bible college. And I say all this not to gloat or brag or anything, but more so to just say that I am so thankful for the opportunity to be up here preaching the word to y'all today. Um, it's, it's awesome. Um, but tonight we're going to have some fun. I know you all have that in here occasionally. Um, <laughs> sorry. We're going to learn about family, and I'm going to talk a little bit about your testimony. I know that sounds weird that I'm going to tell you your testimony, and you probably are like, I don't even know this guy's up here for the first time in front of my face, and he's going to tell me my testimony. Bear with me. Y'all are going to hear a little bit about my testimony and um, just some ins and outs of that, but if you need a Bible, raise your hand. The ushers will come forward with Bibles. If you don't and you already have your Bible, then perfect. <laughs> um, but we have been in Ephesians chapter 2 last week, I believe. We started in there. And um, since I, obviously none of y'all, I'm not trying to shame or anything, weren't in the youth building with us, um, I'm going to give a brief little recap of where we are and what we learned. And that way it sets you all up for an, a better understanding. So the Apostle Paul is speaking to the church in Ephesus, and he's regarding um, just a few of their ideologies and things that they're, you know, not straight on. And um, the one that we initially begin with is that um, their belief that they are saved by works with their relationship with God. And um, later on, we ended up learning in the beginning of Ephesians chapter 2 that you are saved by grace through faith. Um, with Jesus Christ on the cross. And then we learned that there is absolutely nothing that we can do to earn our way into heaven or work our way into heaven, and that is 100% a gift from God. Now, the theme was, and this is um, going to be seen as we go back into the second half of chapter 2, starting in verse 11. It's kind of like a there, now, here, now. Um, and what that means is he's pretty much running through and he's saying, all right, you know, you were here, you were in this sin, you believe in this, you were over there and you were doing that. Now you're here. Now that you've believed in Christ and your ideology is right and you believe that you are saved by grace through faith and not saved by your works, now you're here. And um, he continues that all the way through. Um, but with that being said, we'll just pick it up in verse 11. So... Um, Obviously, the title is One in Christ also, so that's just going to be the title of the message. <laughs> um, but it starts in verse 11. It says, therefore, remember, and you've got to ask what the therefore is there for. Um, but remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, um, before we continue and we get into verse 13, um, just to preface it, it's verse 13 um, sets up the whole thing. But as we're sitting right here and we're, we just went through those couple of verses, 
to put it in perspective for us, he's basically like, look, y'all, y'all, this is where you were. Maybe some of you struggled with idolatry, addiction, sexual immorality. Maybe over here you were, I don't know, gluttony. You like eating stuff and everything like that. But he's saying like, okay, you were over here and you were in this. And now in verse 13, I love but nows in the Bible, by the way. They're always really good. Um, Verse 13 says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. I'll read it again. But now in Christ Jesus, you once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And I want to say that again because there needs to be an emphasis on that it wasn't deserved and that we were in a different place than we are now. That we came from a place where we were doing all these things and we were screwed up and we were living in our own past. And even knowing that we were going to be in that position and that we were going to do those things against God's will and obedience, he said, I want that person. I love that person. I want nothing more than to have communion in heaven with that person if they will do such a little thing as accepting my son as a sacrifice on the cross. And... Man, I am so glad he did that because I would definitely not be here right now. Um, But with that being said, Ephesians 2, 1 through 2, I mean, we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked in the course of the world, and now we are told to be not conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And we have that ability because of the blood of Christ on the cross. We can accept that. We can now do that. But we also see in Romans 5, 8 that God shows his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I want to keep nailing that that Christ died for us thing, because that's everything. That's everything. I mean, mean, literally, if you were ever going to share your testimony, you were ever going to tell anybody what God had done for you, you were ever going to set up, this is where I was, this is where I am now, if verse 13 is not before or after it, it means nothing. It means nothing. Because you can come a long way, but if you don't come a long way because of Christ and his blood on the cross, it means nothing. So, that is verse 13. But, he goes on and he says um, in verse 14, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Um. Before we read the rest of it, I I had read that and I was like, you know what, like, that's true, but sometimes, you know, life's kind of hard and I don't know how divided that wall is. And um, I ended up flipping through, because if I'm real, I don't really know the inside of my Bible like I should. Like, I can't just flip the scripture like that. Um, And I ended up coming across Habakkuk and I read it and I was like, wow, that's, that's great. Um, and he, in Habakkuk, if you haven't read it, he's kind of just going back and forth and he's in this like dialogue where he's like, look, everything's going wrong and it sucks. And like, you know, I don't get why you do that to me, Lord. And basically, um, he comes to a conclusion and this is what it is. It says Habakkuk 13, 17 through 18, though the fig tree should not blossom nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Um, man, yeah, that was good. Sorry, I just came across that and put that in there. Um, but then we go on, and it says, yeah, okay. Verse 15, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace. It might reconcile us both to God and one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, all of us, essentially, um, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. So 
I want to kind of backpedal and, you know, put the pieces together for you. So at the beginning, he's saying, okay, you were here, you were in sin, you were lost, you were struggling, you had no understanding of another side of love of God. And then he's saying, but Christ died on the cross, reminding them of that. That's the therefore remember in verse 11. Um, And then he's saying that also because of that, we have the ability to all be one as a family and community and in church. And that kind of just sounds like, all right, whatever, cool. You know, I get to go to church on Wednesdays and Sundays. But when you think about, like, there, there might be people over there that struggled with a sin, lived in a different state, a different town, different time zone, whatever, than people over here and over there and over there and over there. And miraculously, somehow, because of Christ dying on the cross and our faith in him, we are all in the same room with the opportunity to worship and love and glorify him through reading his word and, and fellowship. And that's, I mean, there's nothing better than that. Like, that is, if that doesn't scream the love of God, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I, I want to nail that in, though. Also, I say that a lot, if you haven't told, couldn't tell already. Um, but because, like, I know there, there might be people in this room that maybe it's the first time, maybe you came with a friend, or maybe you've been here for a while, but I want to say that if, Pastor John or Pastor Mike or Pastor Steve or whoever comes up here, maybe it's me or one of y'all. If they tell you that, like, Calvary Chapel is a family, they're for real. Like, that's for real, for real. Like, Calvary Chapel Lexington is a family. And I want to say that because it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what you smell like. It doesn't matter what your background is. (laughs) It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter, I mean, anything your past you fit in here at Calvary Chapel Lexington, and you fit in in the family of God. And to break down the family part, because I know if I were in the youth, I would think this, but it doesn't necessarily mean like Pastor John's my stepbrother, or Brandon up here is like, I don't know, my cousin. But we are unified by the blood of Christ, and I know that I can go to either of them for anything that I need, any help, any guidance, any anything. And it's all because of God's love for us. And then, yeah. But here's the question that I want to ask. Are we living like it? Like, are we living like we're a family? Um, And I say that because I'm about to throw myself out there now. You know, there's times where I come to church and I've been working all day and I've been working here all day. (laughs) And then I go back and I have class and then I'm studying and everything and then I have to come to church and I see somebody that I haven't seen before. And in my mind and in my heart, I'm like, okay, I know I should go talk to that person. But I sit down and I'm like, I'm not going to. I never see them again. And I know that I'm not the only one here that's done that, but the reason that I throw that out there is because there are people in this room that as family members, we have an obligation to share our testimony and share the gospel with. And I, I want to make that like real for y'all because there is a person in this room, either next to you, across from you, across the room, maybe they're on the patio, maybe they're in the building, in the bathroom, that... God has put your testimony in their life, and they're waiting for you. They don't know it, but they are. Waiting for you to use all of what we just read from 11 to 13, all of that stuff in your past, all of that stuff that used to identify you before you came to Christ is waiting for you to just say, how are you doing today? And waiting for you to go up to them and say, I've been through that too. And I, it's crazy to think that there are people in this room that have never met you, that have never seen you, and they're going through the same stuff that you went through, and God wants to use the presence of all the hard things in your life to help that person. Yeah. (laughs) But... I want, I want to take it even further because I liked what Andre Rogers said the other day where he, I mean, said it like eight times, where he was like, 
you know, if we can get Calvary Chapel on the same page, then we can get the community on the same page, and then we can get the city on the same page, and then we can get the state on the same page, and then it goes to the nation, and then it goes and changes the world. And I want to make that clear because it sounds like a dream. It sounds like, a, okay, whatever. Like, you know, yeah, everybody says that. But, like, the reality of it is, church, is that if we really take it serious, and we extend the hi, how are you, the prayer to the person beside you, across from you, behind you, and we really extend that relationship, we really introduce them to our relationship with God and their relationship with God, if we really do that, and it impacts this church, and it impacts our city, and it impacts our state and our country, we can change the world. And that's not just some cliche, I mean, well, kind of, like every, I'm not a pro- prosperity gospel pastor, but like, that's, that's their cliche kind of line, change the world, give money, whatever. Um, <laughs> but I, I, want, I want to say that because like, it does get pushed under the rug as a possibility. And it's done and starts with the church family. But you can't grow the church family if you don't talk to the person beside you. So, um, yeah, verse 20. Um, Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. I think it's so cool personally that like, as I said, you know, we all came from different backgrounds, Christ died. But like that our relationships and friendships and ministry and church is built upon the very same thing that brought us together built upon the very same thing that brought us together. Verse 21 then says, In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And I, when reading this, it really made me think about how grateful I am for this church family. Because there's been times, and there always is a time, it's not, you know, like, if God says, what if I took that from you tomorrow? It's, you know, when God. It's all, our relationships with God are always in a changing, progressing kind of thing. And, like, if it weren't for this church family in particular, obviously, Church of Christ, family of Christ. But, like, if it weren't for this church family in particular, like, there's plenty of things in my walk with God where I don't know if I would have been able to progress by myself. And I think that there, that's something that maybe some of y'all can relate to in here. Like, there, there are certain things that God gives us in our life that he has the church play a part in for a reason. And I think a lot of that, which is like kind of mentioned in verse 22, is that is the sanctification process of our preparation to be with him, to be in his presence. And it's daily, it's all night, it's all week, all year, all month, and I mean, there are so many of you in here that play a big part in that in everybody's life in here. But, (laughs) so, I wanted to, I don't even know how long I've been up here, but (laughs) I wanted to um, do something that we kind of do with the youth, but obviously there's like, I don't know, what, 150 of you in here, somewhere around there. We normally break out into small groups. And obviously I can't do that because there are so many of you in here. So what we're actually going to do is I am going to put something up on the screen. And when the song starts after I pray, we're going to do that. Um, What that thing is going to be, you can put it up on the screen if you would like. Um, Now what that thing is going to be is you're going to find someone around you, whether it's someone you know or you don't know or more than one or two people and if the Lord puts it on your heart get to know those people but what I'm asking you to do is to just ask one person around you what they need prayer in and I want you to pray for them and I want you to get to know your church family a little better get to know where they need God the most in their life and um, just pray for them and you know love on them Um, so I I'm going to pray now. Thank you all so much for having me up here. God, I just thank you for um, this opportunity. It's always a blessing to be able to get up and preach your word. And um, I just pray that your word um, does not return void. I know it doesn't. 
And God, I just pray that you move in the hearts and the minds of um, Calvary Chapel Lexington and all of Lexington. I pray that, um, Lord, you just fill this room with your spirit. And God, you just change the lives of these people in here. I know you have already. And um, we thank you so much for that. We thank you so much for that. Who we were four, five, 10, 15, 20, 30, however many years ago is nothing like it is now. And it's all because of you. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the opportunity that we have, even through COVID and all kinds of things, to come together and still be in fellowship, present in worship and Bible teaching to learn more about you. I thank you for that opportunity because there's places out there that don't have that right now. And God, I just pray that you continue to protect us. You continue to um, give us loving hearts, calm minds. And God, I just pray that you continue to fill us, fill us with your spirit. We love you and thank you so much for everything you do. Amen. Thank you.